Doktor. Swobu. Zugzug. Welcome to the third devlog for my tank game. In this video, I'll be showing how I implemented a star from scratch in GDScript. I also implemented a priority queue data structure from scratch to help with a star. Now you might be wondering why I wrote a star from scratch when there's already a really good built-in a star node in Godot. I have two reasons. The first is from my experience working at tech companies where I learned that oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, when something is at the very core of the product, it's better to build that core in-house rather than get something off the shelf. When I build it myself, I can tailor it to fit my use case while the off-the-shelf solution is more generic. Also, when the time comes where something doesn't quite work with the whole system because of a bug or a new feature that needs to be added, I'll be able to modify it because I understand it completely, because I built it myself. The second reason is I wanted to. I have the luxury of doing this as a side project, as an outlet for my creativity. This gives me the freedom to satisfy my own curiosities as deeply as I choose to. And as far as going deep, John Carmack actually talks about the value of going deep in his UMKC commencement speech. In that speech, he said, So knowing how to pull the levers of power is rewarding, but there's a satisfaction in really understanding how they work and knowing things very deeply. And there's also a great confidence you can have when you know that you could build something from scratch, even if you choose not to. I'll add a link to the full speech in the description below if you want to watch it. So that's the why I did it. Here's the what I did, and then I'll share how I did it. For demo and debugging purposes, I added a toggleable label to the map. And the numbers correspond to the x, y coordinates of each tile cell on the map. So for example, this tile cell has a x coordinate of 21 and then a y coordinate of 3. And its neighbor has a x coordinate of 22 and the y coordinate of 3. Then I set my right mouse button that when I click on the tile cell, the red tank moves towards it. So for example, if I click here on 3720, the tank goes for goes to it. And then if I click here on 182, a star will calculate a path from 3720 to 182. I added mud tiles to show off movement cost. A star uses movement cost to generate the path. The grass tile has the cheapest cost of all. And quarter tiles and half mud tiles, they have a higher cost than grass. And then the full mud tile has the highest cost of all. So if I click here on 31.2, uh, A star will actually not go through the mud and make a path that goes down here to the grass before going up here to 31.2. Before I show the code, I think it'll be useful to go over briefly how A star works as an algorithm. And the very best explanation of it that I've found is this introduction to the A star algorithm by Amit Patel on redblobgames.com. This is a wonderful resource, and I think it's worth the read for any beginner, beginner indie game developer, such as myself. It has these amazing JavaScript animations that really help you visualize how the algorithm works step by step. If you want an A star tutorial, in my opinion, this is the one to read. The basic idea though is from your starting point, you add that to a frontier variable, which is a priority queue data structure. And then you create a dictionary to keep track of how the nodes are connected. And then another dictionary to keep track of the cost so far. Then you loop through your frontier and you take the node with the lowest priority. And then you look at all of its neighbors you calculate the new cost to reach this neighbor. And if this neighbor has not been reached or this new cost is cheaper than the previously calculated cost to reach this neighbor, then you add it to the frontier and you keep track of which node was used to reach it. So that was a very quick drive by of the A star algorithm. 
If that didn't make sense to you or you want to understand it deeper, again, I suggest reading the whole article. I'll link it in the description below. Now here's how I actually implemented it in my game. I added a new A star state to the state machine of my tank. And my idea in the future is that there will be different enemy tanks, each of them following a different pathfinding algorithm. So some of them will be following depth first search. Uh, maybe some of them will be bumping into walls like a Roomba. And then some of them will be chasing down the player using A star. But anyway, for A star, the way it works right now is that when the user clicks on the map, it calls this move tank function and it takes the tank, uh, the tile that the tank is in, and then also the tile that was clicked on by the mouse, and then it feeds it into this path search function. This path search function is actually the main implementation of A star, and it should actually, it should actually look similar to what's in Red Blob Games. I wrote my own priority queue, which I'll go over in a in a bit. But for now, just think of it as a data structure that in exposes three functions, the insert function, empty, and extract. Insert With insert, you can insert a vector two and the priority value with it. And when you call extract, it always gives you back the vector two with the lowest priority that was inserted into it. And then empty check, just checks whether it's empty or not. I have my own get movement neighbors function and that is here and then what it does is it checks the movement options for a given tile so for example if the tank was on this tile 24 and you call get movement options for it it'll return these tiles above here and to the right and below it it won't return the tile to the left because there's a tree there. So that's not a movement option. I also just, I also check for diagonals. So for example, if the tank was right here on 3720 and it won't fit through, through this gap to 3619. So the get movement options function does not return uh, 3619 as a possible movement option. And then I have a get tile weight function. And what that does is it, it gets the tile weight, uh, the specific movement weight for a tile. And I have that in my game data. So it's a constant uh, dictionary. So the grass is lowest. And then you have the other types of tile, the other types of terrain with uh, mud being the highest. So it gets that from the game data singleton. And then I do this mod, which is, uh, it makes the paths look uh, not ugly. And that's actually a suggestion again from Red Blob Games. So with the mod, uh, without the mod, sometimes you get diagonal paths that look like this. But with the mod, you get um, better looking paths. And the way it works is that it makes it so that every other tile is treated differently. And then it, if, if we went vertically previously, then it'll favor going horizontally next or vice versa. And it does that by just doing this uh, nudge of making the weight of the vertical, if you went vertical, a little bit higher than the weight of a horizontal movement. And then I have a heuristic function, and that one is just uh, calculating the Manhattan distance between two vectors, or in this case, two different tiles on the map. So after A star runs, and after this loop finishes, I have this came from dictionary, which I pass on to the create map path function. And this is actually what creates the path for the tank to follow. For example, if we're here at 24 and we want to go to 29.5, then the path is going to be these series of tiles. And here it is, uh, I printed it out. I then take this list of tile vectors and then I convert it to a list of global position vectors, 
which is what the physics process follows. What it does is it take it looks at the first element of the global path, and then if it it checks if we're there yet, it, if we are there, then pop it off. But if we're not there, then return a uh, vector two that's a normalized move direction that pointing at that global position vector. For the priority queue, I wrote it after studying the Wikipedia page for binary heaps. And my suggestion is if you if you really want to understand this yourself is to take out a piece of paper and a pen and to draw out the tree uh, as it looks on each step of the algorithm. And doing that is what really helped me translate the steps of the algorithm into GD script. So for my implementation, I have three public functions and one of them is insert, and when you pass it a vector two and a cost, uh, right away I translate it into a vector three because that just makes it easier to move around. And then I call the upheap function, which what it does is I compare the added element with its parent. If they're in the correct order, then I stop. The correct order is that the parent is smaller than the child. If it's not in the correct order, then I swap the two and then I call the upheap function again. On extract, if the tree is not empty, I replace the root of the heap with the last element on the last level. And then I call the downheap function, which what it does is it compares the parent with its children and then swaps them uh, if one is smaller and then calls the downheap function again. I actually went on a side quest with this priority queue that I wrote about in my blog. I wanted to benchmark its performance. You see, this priority queue was discovered by a computer scientist in 1964, and I wanted to see how much better it would perform versus a naive approach that a non-computer scientist, such as myself, could come up with on a Sunday morning. So I wrote this naive priority queue class and it exposes the same three public methods, but it only stores the data in an array, and then it sorts the array when you call extract. It doesn't use a tree structure to store the data. I then wrote a test, and the test takes an array of vectors and then inserts those vectors into the queue, but every four vectors, it calls the extract method. And this is similar to how Dijkstra's algorithm or A star would use a queue as a frontier. I then wrote benchmarking code. And what the benchmarking code does is it generates 10,000 random vectors, and then it takes the current time in milliseconds, it makes the priority queue, and then runs the test on it. And then I take the elapsed time by taking the current time again and subtracting it. I do the same thing for the naive priority queue and the binary heap queue which this is the version that the computer scientist discovered it ran the test in 0.1 seconds whereas my naive approach took 58 seconds for the same 10,000 random numbers or random vectors so that's a that's a difference of 54,000% which is amazing all right that's it for this week's devlog in the next video, I'll share how I implemented a custom version of Depth First Search from scratch in GDScript. Thanks for watching. If you like this kind of content, you can subscribe. Goodbye.